In this episode, I'm going to list for you the top five theological influences in my life. So let's go ahead and get started. So hello everyone and welcome back to Grace Nerd. My name is Eric. If you're new to the channel and you enjoy theological conversation or conversation about culture from a Christian worldview, then make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel and leave a like if you enjoy the video. Or if you've discovered the podcast in audio form, make sure that you follow wherever you are. So let's dive right into this list. Throughout my life, I think that there have been various influencers and writers, whether living or dead, who have really sort of caused a turning point or a shift or a clarification in my thinking. And they've really, I'd say, determined the trajectory of my Christian life and my theology in some profound ways. The first one that comes to mind would be John Piper. Now, a lot of you are probably familiar with John Piper. I was introduced to him as I was finishing up my bachelor degree, and I talked about this process in a previous video where I talked about learning to love theology. John Piper's major influence initially, I'd say, was that he allowed me to embrace my identity as someone who enjoyed engaging the Christian faith with my mind as well as my heart, really combining emotion and intellect into one unified whole. I've talked about a time previously when I was on something of a, a missions trip in Bosnia and I was listening to his Tulip series and I was being introduced to his understanding of Reformed theology. I eventually did come to embrace his understanding of Reformed theology, but this wasn't quite the point when it happened. What happened at this point was that I found someone who I could really relate to when they talked about uh, the questions that they dealt with in regard to the Christian faith and the process of really engaging the mind and allowing a, a greater theological understanding to spur on a greater passion and heartfelt faith in God. He really allowed me to be someone who did not leave their mind at the door when it came to approaching the Christian faith. Now, I would say that opinions about John Piper in quote-unquote reformed circles have uh, shifted and changed in various ways throughout the past decade or so. I think there are a lot of people, uh, including me at times, who wish that John Piper was a little bit more explicit and comprehensive in his political commentary, for instance. Many, like me, would prefer, honestly, a little bit more partisanship and explicit conservatism when it comes to politics. There have been times when John Piper has really stood strong in this regard, but there have been people who have thought he's been a little bit, you know, quote-unquote, squishy when it comes to politics, at least in recent years. But regardless of how you feel about him in this regard, I really can honestly say that there's no taking away from what he contributed to my life and to my theological knowledge and to my passion for theology. Number two on my list of theological influences would be closely related to number one. The person I'm going to talk about next is Jonathan Edwards. Now, Jonathan Edwards is actually one of the main influences in John Piper's theological thinking. Like I mentioned when I was talking about John Piper, John Piper wasn't actually the one who finally convinced me to embrace Reformed theology. In the midst of John Piper's Tulip series, while I enjoyed it and learned a lot from it, I remember when John Piper was talking about the first point of Calvinism, total depravity, and he talked about some of the aspects of it that if you don't understand and embrace them, the rest of the system won't work for you. And it was in this context that he began to quote Jonathan Edwards and his classic work, The Freedom of the Will. Now, The Freedom of the Will is one of the most dense and theologically difficult books that you'll ever read if you ever choose to pick it up. Not only is the theological conversation in it really dense and difficult to follow at times because of how complex the concepts are, but the language is also very old. And so while I didn't necessarily follow every single line and argument of it, given its difficulty, there were certain arguments in that book that uh, when they began to track in my mind, there were just parts of a reformed understanding of salvation that once I saw them, I could not unsee them. And I would say uh, it was because of this that I would say Jonathan Edwards was sort of the turning point for me when it came to embracing reformed theology. And that's been the case for a lot of people who have struggled to understand the various uh, concepts of Calvinism and reformed theology. And they struggle to see how it could be biblical and how it could really be philosophically consistent. But once some of these concepts click in the way that Jonathan and Edwards describes them, uh, they seem to be the only logical way that you could understand God's way of salvation. 
section. And it brings you to a point that you could not see the scripture teaching anything else. And this brings me to number three, and this will be the second uh, no longer living person that I would list, and that would be C.S. Lewis. Now, it's debatable uh, the extent to which C.S. Lewis was a reformed theologian. Uh, I would say that there are a lot of places in his writings where you could explicitly say that he is not. But there's actually a, a fascinating sermon by Douglas Wilson, and he talks about the various ways that it was clear that C.S. Lewis uh, was a part of the Church of England, and he had a very strong understanding of their Reformed theology, and there were a lot of ways that he was sympathetic to it. It's also clear that he was progressive in the way that he understood the Christian faith, and reading him from one era will not necessarily be the same as reading him from later in his life. But regardless of where you stand or where C.S. Lewis actually stood on Reformed theology, whether or not he embraced it, that that's actually not really what matters to me in regards to how he's influenced me. What C.S. Lewis has really done for me is show the ways in which fiction and narrative can uh, really communicate profound and deep theological truths. This works with Lewis both in his writing to younger audiences in things like the Chronicles of Narnia, as well as to older audiences in things like the Space Trilogy. His uh, non-fictional work can also also be very helpful as well. People have pointed out that there are flaws in C.S. Lewis's theology. His theology of scripture was very problematic in a lot of ways. He certainly didn't believe in things like inerrancy, at least not early on in his life, and it's debatable whether he ever did. And there's other theological issues as you pick up other works as well. But I've heard it said that C.S. Lewis has a way of kind of driving you nuts in that way, but also edifying you at the same time. I don't think there's ever been a, a writer quite like him, and just a, a lot of his work has sort of worked its way into my subconscious in a way that's probably not something I'm even aware of all of the time but it probably impacts me in many ways. The fourth influence I would like to talk about is Sam Storms. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Sam Storms actually was introduced to me while I was still sort of in my uh, fully charismatic and Arminian phase of life, where most of my theology was influenced by the very basic Pentecostal understanding that I had always known. It was Sam Storms in his book, Chosen for Life, where I was introduced to the idea of the doctrine of election and its relationship to the rest of Reformed theology. I actually was introduced to this, I, I believe, before I even had heard of John Piper. And so at that point, uh, I, I was sort of introduced to the concepts, I became more familiar with them, but I absolutely did not embrace them at that point. My mind and my heart fully uh, resisted it at that time. But after I became Reformed, what I realized was that a lot of people in Reformed circles, for various historical reasons, they tend to also be cessationists, or in other words, they don't believe in the continuous continuing operation of charismatic gifts like prophecy and tongues and things like that. What Sam Storms did for me was that I went back to him after I had embraced Reformed theology, and, and I realized that he was, in fact, what you would call a, a Reformed charismatic or a continuationist. He had embraced Reformed theology, he had that sort of strong exegetical foundation, uh, and yet he also embraced these gifts of the Spirit. And so while a lot of uh, young Reformed people like me often become cessationists, Sam Storms sort of kept me balanced in he allowed me to maintain a lot of my own personal heritage in the charismatic tradition. And I would definitely recommend his work to anyone who struggles with these questions and doesn't know where the balance lies. He's written books like uh, The Beginner's Guide to Spiritual Gifts or Convergence, where he talks about uh, his own embrace of the charismatic spiritual gifts and how he allows that to be balanced with a robust uh, doctrine of scripture and a robust um, theological understanding of the Christian faith. And then finally, I would like to mention James White and his ministry, Alpha and Omega Ministries. Now, again, much of my conversation here is in reference to my sort of conversion into Reformed theology, and this is no exception. When I became a Calvinist and I began to understand the doctrines of grace, it was inevitable that I ran into a lot of writers and Reformed thinkers who tend to be very philosophical in their defense of these doctrines, and they often find themselves floating above the text, you might say, where they show how logically Reformed theology makes sense, but they forget to really back up what they're saying with Scripture. What James White did for me was he took these sort of doctrines that I came to embrace and he reinforced their scriptural foundation. 
he really bolstered my understanding and my defense of reform theology with exegetical arguments. That's one thing he did for me. And that's again, in reference to reform theology, but beyond that, James White's not just a Calvinist. He's also a strong apologist and has debated all kinds of people in a general defense of the Christian faith. And in the process of this, he has introduced me to the idea of what is called presuppositional apologetics. Now, I'm not going to go into a full-blown definition of what that means, but basically there is sort of a debate among apologists between what you might call classical or evidential apologetics and presuppositional apologetics. In my view, presuppositional apologetics really, it takes the scriptures much more seriously in regard to the nature of human beings apart from Christ and the way that the human heart responds to something like apologetics. It doesn't so much jump right to all of the technical defenses of the Christian faith in regard to, you know, the cosmological argument and scientific evidence and refuting every single supposed contradiction in the Bible. But it really, it, it confronts the sinner and it exposes the inconsistencies that kind of become inevitable when you reject God. It shows the impossibility of a worldview that rejects the existence of God, rejects the truth of God. And it shows how once you uh, step outside of the Christian faith and try to critique the Christian faith, you are basically removing yourself from a universe where Christianity could even be critiqued. For more on that, again, I would recommend watching debates from James White or looking into writings of people like Greg Bonson. And Greg Bonson is someone who is well known for uh, popularizing the writings of Cornelius Van Til, who really clarified the biblical nature of the presuppositional method of arguing. And I'd say the final thing that James White has done for me is that he he's really built sort of a, a consistent foundation for me in the importance of if you're in debate with someone or in disagreement with someone, or if you're talking about someone not in the room whose views you disagree with, it's important that you always represent the views of your opposition accurately. Because if you misrepresent the one that you're arguing with, just to make it easier to argue with them, you're basically handing over your credibility to them. You're giving them ammunition that they don't need. But if you represent someone else in a way that satisfies them, it gives you a, a lot more power in your own arguments once you actually then begin to critique a different worldview. Now, all of these influences have really impacted me in various ways. And honestly, they would often differ with one another on various topics. And, you know, to be honest with you, some of these people probably wouldn't even recommend the ministry of the other on a consistent basis because their differences have often been so strong. But I'd say that all of them have impacted me in various ways and they've all contributed something different. They've all sort of shaped, I'd say, my, you know, style, personality, approach to the Christian faith. They've all added nuances in the way that I approach things that many of which I'm probably not even conscious of anymore. But there you go. If you've heard of any of these guys and you've enjoyed their ministries, make sure you comment below in the way that they've impacted you. Or if I've just introduced them to you, let me know uh, what you think of your discovery. Make sure you comment your most strong influences as well. And if you've enjoyed this list or learned something, make sure that you leave a like on the video and uh, make sure again, if you're new to the channel, that you uh, subscribe and and if you're listening in audio form, make sure that you follow wherever you are. Again, my name is Eric. This is Grace Nerd, and we'll see you around in the next one. Thanks for watching.